Welcome to EcoSY. Today we have conversation around quality. We're going to be talking about quality as a mindset. And I have with me Anthony Murphy, who is the Vice President of Product Management at Plex. So welcome, Anthony. How are you doing today? Well, I appreciate you having me here. I am uh, I am doing fantastic. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's a, it's a lovely day. Looking forward, been looking forward to this conversation with you for a while now. And so excited we're able to get together. And, you know, when you start talking about the, the word quality, a lot of things come to mind, particularly in the industrial manufacturing world. But for you, what comes to mind? Yeah, it's a it's a really good point and a good question, Chris. You know, I I come from manufacturing. It's it's been in my background. It's what I've done. And you know, historically in manufacturing, we tend to think about quality in terms of you know things like total quality management (TQM). And so we think about things like inputs around you know product and uh, people and process, and and then that should lead to good outputs around again good product and good processes and good audit results. And we measure that through things like cost of work quality or parts per million, but you know, that's sort of this uh, like legacy sort of linear way of thinking about quality, right? It's the industrial era way, like it's A plus B equals C. It's, it's algebraic. And, and so I think when we think about quality, uh, we think about quality in more of a holistic manner, right? And thinking about things like not just product quality and total quality management, that is important. We make products, those products have to be good. But we like to think about things, and when I think about quality, I think about it uh, holistically in terms of every interaction and every stakeholder. So things from like how do we engage with our customers, right? So whether it's you know time to resolution on issues, or how fast are we turning around quotes, uh, or even things like customer satisfaction or repeat orders, uh, to how we engage with our suppliers, right? And, and what does our overall supplier quality look like? And certainly managing the upstream supply chain, but also our supplier relationships, and even to things like employees and communities. We know that literally everybody is dealing with a skilled labor shortage. And so thinking about employee retention, employee satisfaction, and employee engagement, um, as well as community and how you're engaging with community. So when I think about quality and when we think about quality, uh, that's really how we think about it. It's certainly total quality management and product quality, but it has to have a more sort of holistic and and all-encompassing sort of approach. Yeah. I mean, it definitely sounds like that's a pretty big shift from the the old mindset of quality from the legacy days, right? Yeah, it, it can be. And it, and it is. And um, it, uh, it takes some time and it takes some doing. But it is where if you think about sort of leading manufacturers and those who are going to be able to, you know, whether any sort of changes, right? All these things that we talk about today with like skilled labor shortage and supply chain shortages, material shortages, these are things we've been dealing with as manufacturers for decades. Like this is nothing new. Now it's, it's exacerbated and accelerated. But when you think about, you know, how do we as a manufacturing organization, like weather today's changes and be prepared to handle whatever comes next, however fast it comes at us, we really do need to think about things more holistically. Mm, Definitely. I want to get your take on something, Anthony, too, because a term that I keep hearing all the time is digital transformation in the the industrial manufacturing world. And when you think about that, where does quality fit into that? Because is there a digital transformation that you see from a quality standpoint that that would come that comes to mind? Because I li- I like to get your your insight here. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and digital transformation and industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing these are all like really big terms, and they can be daunting. And in some cases, you kind of look at it, you're like, that's kind of a little fluffy. What does that actually mean? Um, right. And if you if you think about that sort of holistic approach to quality and it's sort of every piece of the organization and every person and every process, it absolutely fits in. Um, but it doesn't have to be this like big daunting, like, oh, my goodness, I suddenly have to be able to run lights out manufacturing tomorrow. Right. Uh, it's absolutely a journey and you take it sort of a bit by bit. But the way it the way it fits in is if you think about how do you drive this sort of culture as a quality where Every employee is involved and every person involved and every stakeholder is is considered. Uh, and we're not only doing the things that are driving that culture of quality, but we're also, you know, as employees or our employees are seeing us doing it and they're seeing others doing it. You know, the way to do that is, is you start digitizing processes and you take the sort of the manual effort, like filling out paperwork or shuffling paperwork around. Um, and you start to you start to automate that. And, and you can again, you can take it process by process, but then that makes it easy to do the right thing. Uh, and to do the things that you want people to do and focus on that culture of quality. So it absolutely has a place and, and it absolutely has um, it has impact on every aspect of the business. 
Uh, but it doesn't have to be this this huge daunting. I have to do it all in all in one shot. Right. I mean, so are you looking for areas of low hanging fruit? The sim- simple items first. Is that kind of what, what you would recommend to people? Yeah, typically we'll see customers like, you know, for example, we uh, a big part of what we do is we help manufacturers digitize their operations. And so we'll find like it could be starting as simple as, hey, look, our we need to just digitize and see what our scrap rates are and our OEE is. I, we have tools that you could just quickly visualize that so you can identify and visualize the issue and then go address it. Or uh, we have quality management solution, for example, where uh, you can digitize the sort of document control and, and document auditing process as one component and then start digitizing the overall quality and all the way up into running your entire shop floor. And so the guidance we give uh, to to customers and, and largely the manufacturing industry is, you know, don't don't feel daunted by like, you know, oh my goodness, I have to go drive this whole, you know, transformation initiative over my entire company and it's going to take forever is find the places where you have the most pain and you have the most to gain. And, and start there. And it can be small. Get some quick wins. Get some buy-in. You'll start to see that organizational change and some of that cultural change. And then it'll be easier to say, oh, look at this thing we did over here that's having all of this benefit, right? Root it and anchor it in real business outcomes and, and things that you can measure. And then you can take it to the next uh, sort of the next areas. And, and it just becomes this sort of snowball effect. Absolutely. One of the best pieces of advice we've ever had on EcoSY. Uh, Tessa Myers actually told us to think big and act small. Yep. And, you know, ha- have that, that big vision. So, you know, pro, you know, processes, programs like this definitely have a long, long go- uh, goal at the end, but taking those incremental steps to get there, man, that's, that's key. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great way. It's a great way to think about it. And, and Tessa is uh, an incredibly sharp and an experienced manufacturing leader. Um, and then it is, you have a, you have a view of the future, you know what the future needs to look like, you know where you want to go and you want to inspire your team to get there. And then you just take mm-hmm. every day, you take a little bit of a, a step forward. Absolutely. Now you mentioned earlier in your, in your answer, Q, quality management solution, you know, QMS, you know, when you think of that, about that for manufacturing, you know, what are some of the tentacles that, that, that are included there? Yeah. You know, we think about QMS and quality management, again, trying to at, at its broadest scope, touching everything that is around uh, quality management. And so for us, we think about it from the top to the bottom. So you think about the highest piece or the highest level is, is compliance. And so how do we articulate mm-hmm. how we are going to comply, whether it's in you know a regulatory standard or a, a, a specific customer standard, or even things that we're doing inside of our own organization, if you think about you know, how we comply with, with ISO. And then outlining that, uh, all the different steps, who's responsible, what are the things we need to do, along with the ability to not only assign actions, but to drive accountability to those actions with, you know, sort of workflow mm-hmm. tools. So it becomes, again, easy to do the right thing. And then we drive that into the execution layer, which is, you know, you think about things like um, failure mode effects analysis and control plans. Again, and these things are all completely digitally linked so that you, you set it up in one spot and it starts cascading throughout. And so now we're starting to say, what are the risks and the issues that could happen how do we mitigate those? What are we going to do if those risks do occur? And then how are we going to contain the issue? And so you start to get this proactive, forward-looking approach that says, oh, I've got an issue that I might have over here. Let's prevent that from happening. And then into the execution side, which is you know governing the operations and making it almost impossible to do the wrong thing. And so we have what we call check sheets, which has you know gauge integration. So down to the, you know, the caliper, or if you've got an ID check or an OD check, and then driving the operators to fill both those quantitative and qualitative checks in. So taking measurements into things like statistical process control. So we're measuring and doing, you know, uh, upper and lower control limits. But then the other piece is, you know, it's all about continuous improvement. So things are going to go wrong. It's going to happen. Uh, and so we have a continuous, a set of continuous improvement tools that you can link directly to, like if I have a piece of inventory that's suspect, or I had a product that has uh, bad quality or there's an operator who did something incorrectly and we see that manifest in bad product, we can drive and we can link directly to that and then drive these continuous improvement tools to help make sure we identify the root cause. But as importantly, each one of these tools, again, fully linked and it sort of drives this holistic approach of quality. The more important thing is, is it brings the organization in to the process 
So it's not just the quality manager who's got the responsibility here or a supervisor who's got responsibility there. Even when we think about these continuous improvement tools, you can bring a team together and drive that engagement again. So you're driving that culture of quality. So it, it sort of sustains even beyond, uh, beyond the individual issue. And you can start to propagate that mindset throughout the organization. Okay. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was getting ready to ask you about, is it, you know, you have the, <clears throat> the controls engineers and they have their smart manufacturing industry 4.0 initiatives. They're connecting all the new devices that are out there, these smart devices. They're bringing in all this data. I was just wondering, did, did they see that quality as, you know, a, a friend or a foe, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, to try to work, are we working together on the same team or, or, or are we constantly, you know, butting heads together? So it sounds like it's more of a friend from your standpoint. Absolutely. It is absolutely a friendly relationship. And again, part of the, you know, if you think about the engineering staff, it's all about how do I connect everything together, looking to automate and drive, you know, certainly more efficiency, but, but drive out, you know, um, you know, drive out this sort of uh, variability in the process. And so where quality is concerned, you know, quality managers uh, and even, you know, manufacturing and production supervisors really want the same thing. And so all of our tools are designed to, you know, be able to take that information directly from an operator or connect directly to the equipment, whether it's a PLC or an asset or even an individual gauge. And so that's where, to your point, everybody gets to be really friendly is, you know, quality is like, this is the objective, right? We want to make good product. We want to have a good customer experience. We have a good employee experience and we want to do that efficiently, right? Because quality, the quality department is never the most overstaffed department, right? It's always a, you know, a mighty team of two or three. Um, and then the controls engineers, like we want to connect things together and it's, you can do those things and do those things easily. So it becomes this nice sort of symbiotic relationship where, you know, we're helping each other uh, accomplish each other's goals. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like that has a pr pretty tremendous impact on overall company culture as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it helps because people are bringing it together. And again, if you think about what the long term vision is, what's our company vision and mission? And what are we trying to accomplish? What are our overarching objectives? And then everything cascading behind that, you know, these digital tools and these, you know, again, these transformation initiatives all align behind those things. And so it drives it helps drive visibility and transparency into what's working and what's not working well and, and how we can, um, you know, make those things better and improve those metrics. It helps bring people together and aligning behind core metrics and, and core initiatives. It helps, you know, frankly, like, look, as a quality manager or a quality engineer, you don't want to be running behind people and trying to, uh, you know, hey, did you fill out this piece of paper or go find the piece of paper that somebody filled out or, you know, like, no, that's not the right rev. You want to be using your brain and your talents to help drive continuous improvement initiatives. And so, these types of things allow people to use their brains in, in the way we're made to be used in, in these really creative problem solving sort of ways, but also aligned as an organization. And so it absolutely drives uh, a, a holistic culture of, a, uh, of quality. Yeah. And now the, I'm, I'm assuming I can, I'm only going I'm, I don't want to assume this. Is there a ripple effect that impacts the greater community that, that the organization would sit in? If you do it, if you do it well and you do it right, absolutely, because everybody starts to, you know, naturally you see people working together. Um, we're, we're naturally removing the friction. We're making it easier to do the right thing and to make good product. And, and look, people want to do the right things. And so you start to see this like, yeah, this investment and this drive to do the right thing. And you start to drive up that visibility and transparency to the metrics. And again, if leadership, you know, culture will happen whether you're whether you want it to or not, it happens when you're not looking. So if leadership is really driving that vision uh, and has this is driving this culture of engagement, and transparency and sharing out, you know, what's working, what's not working and what we're doing about it. Absolutely. And then, you, you know, you had mentioned we were talking a little bit ago about sort of continuous improvement. You know, if you bring people together and that's part of the way we architect our tools is, you know, bringing everybody into the process, it can help as well. And so, hey, look, it's, you know. Department B had nothing to do with the, the issue that we're, we're facing, but we want to bring someone in. It's an outside, fresh perspective, right? New set of eyes that can come in and collaborate. But then when that person, you know, that came from Department B goes back, they're going to tell that story of being involved and it sort of propagates throughout. And so it can absolutely help spread. And then when you've got every employee engaged and every employee bought in, it just, again, it continues that momentum and it helps you overcome you know, whatever tomorrow's challenges are, because you're ready for it and you've got everybody bought in and sort of rowing in the same direction. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it just sounds like it's, it's, it's such benefit 
that when it's done correctly. But I also want to understand. I've been in many plants that I've been in. I know not everything comes together as we as we always hope. So, <laughs> but what are any any headwinds that that you commonly see working with QMS programs and implementation that you like to share just to let our listeners know some of really what they could expect? Yeah, you know the the common the common headwinds or the things where you see where you know it's like oh you got a course correction is you know just the point you were making earlier Chris about getting everybody together is you know if if you don't have a uh, a common vision of the future and the goal line and it's not consistently communicated and then when you start on that journey and you take that step by step if you don't get the right people involved and you're not consistently communicating people are going to naturally resist cuz they're not part of it they don't feel ownership they don't feel buy in they feel caught off guard and so the major thing around when you're you know uh, engaging in these sort of digital transformation initiatives and implementing things like QMS is, you know, you want to be communicating, you want people to be involved, you want to give them ownership and you want to give them buy-in. It's absolutely, you have to have a roadmap for the future. You absolutely have to have leadership communicating the why and the when and the where, um, but you need to bring people along. Um, and then in helping people understand, you know, why it's important to them and how it will help them, right? It's not designed to you know, eliminate jobs or things like that. It's designed to help us be better and do better and make better products. And so I think that's sort of, you know, thing one, and it's it's a core tenant of, of change management. Uh, the other thing that we've seen be super helpful where we see uh, manufacturers be really successful is, again, connecting what they're doing with, you know, a quality management initiative to a broader sort of company mission. So, you know, if you're in industrial manufacturing, let's say you're making automotive products, right? Um, one of our favorite examples is we have a customer who makes glove boxes and, and, and other interior components. And you're like, wow, you know, a glove box. I don't know. I don't put my gloves in there. I think all that it stores is like an owner's manual. But right. what they've said is, and, and I don't look at my owner's manual. Um, I tried once. I got confused. But what they, said, what they said is like, did you know that the glove box is actually a safety system? And so when you get in an accident, that glove box will actually help save your life. Same with the center console. And so they said, the re- so for us, you know, it's not just shipping a glove box, right, where you can store your manual and maybe some leftover napkins, right? It's all about like where this product that we're building will actually save somebody's life, life if they get into a car accident. And so making that product in the highest quality manner with zero defects is not just going to help our company and it's not only going to help our market position and help our bottom line, but it's going to save somebody's life one day, right? And so connecting that digital transformation initiative to a broader mission is is really super, super important. And so that's the other thing we see where companies are really successful in driving change is, is connecting to that mission. And I used an example from an automotive manufacturer. You could pick any sort, any industry, the thing that you're making has a purpose out in the world uh, that is driving the world forward and helping things be better. It's one of the great things about manufacturing, right? Literally everything gets made. Um, yeah. And so just that that can really help drive that initiative and get people bought in. No kidding, man. I, I immediately brought a, a, a story came to mind when you were telling that. So we used to do motor repair at Eco, and I oversaw that. And motors would come in and go out. We had a whole quality program, right? And the technicians, they only saw what they worked on. Like that, yep. that motor would come in, they'd fix it, it'd go out. They'd come in, you know, they'd just assembly line type type deal. All custom jobs, though. And so I, I shut the shop down one day, and we took a field trip. And we went to one of yeah. our best customers, and I and I had the customer just give us a tour. And, man, they, they would pull out their phones and take pictures of the motors that they worked on. And and I asked, well, where do you know that? Oh, I'm showing my wife, I'm showing my kids. I mean, we, we had a bigger tie to, you know, cause my point was, you know, you guys see this little piece of the world, but you're right. impacting a bigger world. And then the, the products these manufacturers make literally go all over the world. So it was a really cool way to build up that, that culture and that, and then I tell you what quality really went through the roof after that as well, just because they were bought in. They see it, right? It's like this, my work does this and, and there's pride in what we do. And there's even more pride when you talk to, you know, the, at the end customer, you see what the work, uh, what, what it does. Absolutely. That's a really cool story. Yeah, man. I love it. I love it. So maybe the last, the, one of the last questions here on, on the quality standpoint is from a time, from a timeline, when you start trying to make these changes, 
what, what's, what's a reasonable expectation to actually get this going in the right direction? Yeah. So for us, you know, one of the, the core tenants for us, because we, we serve manufacturers, we only serve manufacturers. We cut, we all come from manufacturing. I mean, before I joined Plex, I ran a, I ran a shop. And, um, and so for us, it's all about, it's got to be pragmatic and it's got to be quick and it's got to be easy and it's got to drive value. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so for us, we look at it in terms of how can we get manufacturers up and running quickly? Um, and so for our quality management, we'll actually get uh, customers up and running in just a couple of weeks. Right. And so, you know, to the point earlier, we were talking about, you know, step by step, you know, get up the, the core compliance components and, and making sure we've got good document control and, and able to govern the first parts of the processes in as little as two and three weeks. And then wow. the other piece is, you know, the balance of it where you're driving quality throughout the rest of the organization with things like gauges and check sheets. Um, you know, that's typically a month or two. So it's uh, it's not this really crazy, complex, you know, shut the plant down, multiple year endeavor. Uh, we literally measure these things in, in terms of, of weeks and weeks and months. And we have other solutions we can get up and running in a day, right? Just to, we hook things up to the machine and start popping data off the machine and, and drive some visualization and dashboarding. You can start to see things like OEE and scrap and, and you can start to make some quick decisions. And so, um, it, again, to your, to your earlier question, earlier point, it isn't and doesn't have to be this really crazy, um, daunting, insurmountable task. Just little steps at a time and can be done really, really quickly. I love it. I was not expecting that answer. I, I was really thinking it was going to be like a six to 12 month endeavor, but that's, a, that's a extremely encouraging to hear that it can move. It can be moved that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's part of our design and thought process and principle is, you know, we need to get manufacturers quick time to value so that they can do what they do best, making these great products that go out into the world and, and make a difference. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, let's transition a little bit. And let's talk about you and, and your career. You're, you're definitely doing some wonderful things there at Plex. So give us a little bit of your story. But how did you get to where you're at right now? Well, I've had a, a bit of a, a winding and, and circuitous path. Um, you know, I, so I, I was born and raised uh, in Michigan and, and in manufacturing. Uh, my parents met inside of a manufacturing plant. Um, and then, uh, my, my dad wanted to make sure that I, I understood what it meant to do a hard day's work. And he put me to, uh, he put me to work, uh, inside a manufacturing plant, shoveling steel. And, um, and I loved it. And, uh, and so the idea was, Hey, look, you know, do this through high school and go to college, get a degree and I don't know, go be a lawyer or something. And, uh, I just fell in love with manufacturing. And so, you know, joke was joke was on him, I think, because I, I worked through in manufacturing through high school and college and, and then never left. Um, and I held a variety of roles from you know, purchasing and logistics to uh, I did a lot with IT, as you might imagine, um, and did operations as well. And then uh, joined Plex probably about 13 years ago because I loved at, at every everything I did inside of manufacturing was just trying to be like more efficient and do more with the same and and compete with those who are bigger than us. But, you know, we didn't have the same amount of resources. And so we always use technology to do that. And and I really found um, uh, the sort of kindred spirit in Plex and that that's what Plex did. And so uh, I made the I made the leap and and I've always stayed close to the uh, the customers. And so I spent uh, when I joined Plex, I was in our support and services organization, helping implement customers and get them uh, help them through their digital transformation. And, you know, I led some teams and ultimately made my way into product management um, where I get to to lead the team who's responsible for, you know, deciding what we're going to build and crafting that strategy and then executing against it so that, you know, our customers and, and, and our future customers can take advantage of all the things that we've been talking about and, and really make a, really make a, a difference in their employees' lives. Wow. What a great story. Well, it sounds like you've done it all. So, did you do operations just because you like stress? I'm just curious. Why'd you pick that little outfit? <laughs> <Here, stupid? laughs> fun, fun fact. I, I do. Uh, it's funny. My wife is like, I really wish you didn't like hard problems as much as you do because, you know, uh, you might get more sleep. But um, I do. I, I like stress. The best part is I, 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 told, I, I worked in manufacturing through college and I went and got an operations management degree in college because I, I just liked it so much and the, the complexity of it all. Right. Um, so yeah, it, it is, uh, I am, a I am a sucker for a really hard problem that, you know, everybody else is like, no, nah, we'll leave that one to later. I'm like, that's the thing right. I want to go. I will, we'll go, we'll go put our head into that one. 
I'm very thankful for guys like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, since kind of sticking on that same thing, let's put on that thread a little bit. What, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that industry has right now? Because I'm, you're at a pretty good viewpoint from where you sit there at Plex. Is, are there anything that keeps coming back consistently that you like to share? Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is we see, you know, we, we see things like material shortage and supply chain shortages and, and, and labor shortages and skilled worker shortages. And I mean, those are the easy things to talk about and say, because they're in the, the newspaper headlines. But, you know, those things have been around for forever. They just, you know, have sort of been accelerated. Um, you know, I think when we really start to think about where manufacturing is and, and is going and the things to consider, um, it really becomes that the biggest thing is being able to shift and pivot quickly, right? So today I am making product X and I am in market Y um, and my manufacturing facilities do these things and they're put in these locations. But, you know, it, it, as I, as a manufacturer, it, it's less about now the product that I make uh, and the market that I'm in. I need to expand and think about different markets, different industries, different products, right? And the challenges that exist today are not going to be the ones that exist tomorrow. And there's going to be all new ones we haven't even thought of yet. And so I think the thing that the you know most manufacturers are really, really struggling with and, and need to be prepared for and thinking about is this, you know, resiliency and agility, right? So, you know, being able to quickly move and change my business uh, to, you know, whether it's new products or new industries, being able to, you know, have a, a handle on my business and have the right people and the right technologies in place so that no matter what comes in my way, I can be resilient and weather those storms and again, quickly pivot. I think underpinning all of these things that we talk about, you know, um, all of the things you can read about in the head, uh, news lines and the head, uh, newspapers and in the headlines, it's really about resiliency and agility. And I think that's what manufacturers are struggling with the most. And again, I think that's why it's mm. so important as you think about driving this culture of quality and having these digital solutions, it gives you the control as well as the data and the insight. And then likewise, the culture to be able to move and shift and shake as, as things change and, and likewise be able to, to predict uh, some of those things as well. Right. That's, I love that resilience and agility. And I'm also thinking, but just from your, from your story, you fell in love with manufacturing. You definitely have a heart for it. Let's say there's somebody out there listening right now that they, 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 they're starting to dip their toe in the water a little bit, Anthony, around manufacturing. And, and, and you want to give them some advice to go ahead and tell them to get fully in the pool. It's time to get in the pool. So what would you give? What advice would you give them to start pursuing that career a little bit further? Yeah, you know, it's a good it's a good question. Um, you know, I think first and foremost is is fall in love with the hard problems. Um, those things are just that your complex puzzles to go to go solve. Um, and those are the things that are, I think, ultimately the most, the most rewarding. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, the thing I think that's ultimately guided my career. I think the second is, um, you know, there is manufacturing is an amazing community and everybody wants to help. Um, you know, when, when, when I ran a plant, we had competitors, uh, and we would be oftentimes like we'd be bidding for the same customer in the same job, the same order but we would still help each other. It was like, oh man, I can't get a shipment of material. And I called the, you know, the guy up down the road, be like, Hey, can I borrow some from you? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. No worries. You know, pay it back. Or I'm like, man, I'm really struggling to make this product. You know, they'd send somebody down and we'd put our head into it. Now we'd go back out into the market the next day and we'd be going head to head trying to win that business. Um, and so I'd say it's a, it's a really tight knit um, and it's a really sweet community. Everybody wants to help each other. And so you can find and should find people um, that you can buddy up with and, and be mentors and, and everybody wants to, to help. Um, and so I'd say that's the, uh, that's the other thing. And then the third piece, if someone's like, I'm not sure if this thing is or isn't for me, um, you know, maybe I want to do something else. I'd say, you know, manufacturing is the biggest industry in the world. And, and the story I like to tell, like, literally everything gets made. Um, and uh, you look at the grass that's out in your front yard, right? Someone makes that grass seed. Right. Like so everything in the world gets made. It's this really interesting industry. Um, it's completely resilient because everything is and will always need to get made and will always need smart people to have solve hard problems and people who want to collaborate. And so, you know, those are the, the sort of the three things I say, like if you're if you're considering manufacturing or you're starting manufacturing, you're not sure if it's for you. Um, you know, those are the those are the three things that I'd, I'd say uh, 
I'd say to go take a look at because it's, I mean, it's been an amazing, amazing career for me. Um, when I started in manufacturing, I didn't think I'd get into technology and technology for manufacturing. And here I am. And so you can, you know, choose your own adventure, right? The, the sky's really the limit. No kidding. I love, <clears throat> I love that answer, Anthony. I'm, and I'm also curious as well. There may be a listener that are, they're thinking of, they have this perception of manufacturing. They're like, man, I don't want to do that. It's dark, dirty. It's dangerous. It's no place for me. Go ahead and, and, and debunk that for that, for that listener right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. That is one of the things people are like, oh man, I'm going to be out there. And, you know, Anthony, you were talking about shoveling steel earlier. Like, I don't want to shovel steel. Like, that's, that is not what manufacturing is anymore. It is this amazing place of transformation and automation. I mean, we're talking about building and, and customers are using things like AR and VR to do guided work instructions. And we're talking about some of the cleanest plants and cleanest facilities in the world. It is not that, you know, what you see in the movies and TV where, you know, people are coming out and they're just, they're oh, dirty. And, you know, it's, it's not that anymore. Um, it's a place of technological revolution. It's a place where the newest technologies like AI and machine learning and AR and VR are, are actually driving processes. So, um, you know, even, even things like, look, I'm, I'm super interested in becoming a, an engineer or even a software engineer. There is so much that is going into the manufacturing environment in those industries where we're building product for that. Um, so it is not it's a it's a place of the future. It's not a place of the past. And I think that what gets represented in the media is that old school sort of like, you know, smoke flying everywhere. Things are on fire. Um, it is absolutely not that. No, not at all. And we need to start celebrating more, particularly around when young people make that decision to take those paths, that needs to be celebrated like a vocation path, for instance, just as much as someone who's going to a four-year university, you know, going for a business degree. I mean, you got to start having different types of conversations. And um, really, because I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a good opportunity to make a great living inside manufacturing. And uh, just, I'm just thankful for you for, for sharing that, that insight as well, because it's, it's definitely something that we need to be talking about more. No, I appreciate it and, and totally agree. And, and one of the things that we've been doing at, at Plex and Rockwell is, is to your point, giving back to and getting into, you know, the next generation. And so we've got a, a big bunch of work we do with uh, colleges and, and trade colleges and high schools to show this is what manufacturing is and, and what it looks like and, and how, you know, what it looks like to run a production line. But, you know, we're, we're leveraging, um, our software along with other Rockwell software and doing like things like digital twins. And, and again, teaching the, yeah. you know, the next generation of what smart manufacturing looks like. And so it's really cool to see as you get to talk to these, you know, the next generation who, you know, they're like, I, I want to be a software engineer. Like, yes, you can. Let me show you. And they're like, Oh my goodness, you guys are like, we're using machine learning and predictive algorithms to, to determine, you know, things like what's the best way to, to run a, a piece of equipment. And so, it's this really cool. It's this really cool opportunity to, to help build up the next generation of manufacturing and manufacturing leadership. Hey, I love it. I love it. I love your energy, by the way, as well. It just you can tell you you have a passion for what you do. So I am curious, just to pull on that a little bit too. When are you the happiest? So when you have a day where you come home and you just have a joy, you you feel like you got a lot accomplished. What were you doing that day to make you feel that way? Yeah, that is a good. That is a good question. Um, there's a there's a couple of things. One is I when I have the most joy, right? I come home and and uh, my wife's like, "Wow, you're really you're a chatterbox today!" Like, and I'm, and I'm going a million miles an hour telling her yeah. about what's going on. You know, there's there's a couple of things that always comes back to. Um, it it's always about the team and the people. And so anytime I'm able to to work with the broader team and uh, the team inside of Plex and Rockwell, just incredibly smart and, and humble people uh, who really do really great and hard work. And so getting to, you know, interact with them and, and likewise to, to our conversation earlier, like we had this like really hard problem that we've been trying to, you know, work through and we finally, you know, uh, figure it out. Um, those are the days that, that I get the most energized and, and, you know, the cherry on top or when I'm, when I'm going a hundred million miles an hour is, uh, when I get to go and, and visit our customers and see all the great things that they're doing and, you know, not only seeing how their processes are running, but how they're using Plex and seeing the impact it's having on their businesses and their employees' lives. Those are the days where, you know, it's hard for me to get to sleep at night because you just can see the impact and, and the benefit. And so uh, those are the days that that I, I look forward to. Man, well, thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds like you have some 
some fun. Do you get to get out to the plants a lot? I do. I do. And, and you know, with travel restrictions uh, lightening up, um, I get to get out even even more now. And so I've been to probably thousands of, of plants now across a variety of industries and, and even countries. And, and so that's a lot of fun, too, as you get to see how, you know, customers in Europe are, are doing things for, and there's customers in, in the U.S. Or, or, or even in Asia Pacific. But then also the similarities and commonalities. And so it's just uh, uh, my my boss used to joke with these like one of these days, Anthony, you're going to go out into one of those plants and then we're just never going to come back out because you're just going to stay there and work. I was like, that actually may happen. I, I get so I get so excited. Well, if, if your travels ever bring you to Raleigh, North Carolina, please let me know, because I'd love to, to go to a plant with you and just see you light up the plant. That'd be awesome. No, I, I, we will we will plan that trip out. You can bank on it. All right. All right. Well, at towards the, the end of our Eco Ask Why conversation, Anthony, we like to take a little detour off of the professional path. Just talk about you and just in general for fun. So do you have any hobbies that you, that, that you uh, enjoy? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, no, I actually, uh, I am not what most people call a fun person. So uh, my, <laughs> my favorite things to do is I love to, I love to read. Um, I love spending time with, with my wife and, and uh, we just got uh, just about a year ago, uh, a little puppy. So she keeps us, she keeps us busy. And then I try to stay, uh, I try to stay active. Um, and so I like to get outside and, and run and, and those types of things. Um, but other than that, okay. you know, uh, love a love a good book. Okay, okay. But you're a runner too, huh? Yeah, I am. All I am. right. Now, so so you like distance running? How, what, what type of running are you doing? So I I uh, I'll do distance. Um, used to do uh, half marathons, and I've I've sort of scaled that scaled that back. I don't run fast, but I I run for the it, uh, just the enjoyment of it. Right, you get out, clear your head yeah. a little bit, you think, and and uh, and get some sunshine. But um, but I try to do, you know, somewhere between, you know, six and seven miles a day and just kind of get out and and then get some fresh air. That's great. Now, you are, are you running? Personally, I'm asking this. Do you run with uh, earphones? Do you run just nothing? Are you listening to anything when you go or are you just just you? I do. Road? So I um, I'll, I'll uh, I'm, I'm smiling because you're about to find out how fun I really am. Not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I love listening to podcasts, but the other thing I've, I've really started to get into is um, I listen to uh, earnings calls for publicly traded manufacturing companies. So just listening to the things that they're, you know, if you think about the like the American Axles or the three M's or Johnson and Johnson to get really learn a lot about the the challenges that they're facing. Uh, and so that's what I, what I typically listen to when I'm, when I'm running is I'll listen to that and I'm like, Oh, wow. Interesting margin compression because of you know this this plant had that issue and so um, so yeah that's what I uh, that's what I tend to listen to. All right, so you definitely have some new territory there. Nobody's ever answered a question that, <laughs> that way. So where do you find the earning calls at? I mean, are there podcasts that have these calls that you listen to? Yeah, so there's two two apps you can get. Um, one is called uh, Bursi, B-U-R-S-I, and I think the other one's called Quarter. It's Q Q U A T R. And they'll just they'll aggregate like all of the earnings calls that for publicly traded companies and they just post them out on a schedule and, and you can listen to them just like you would listen to a podcast. That's incredible. OK. All right. So that's 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 new dirt for us. Well, we'll, we'll try to put those links in the show notes, too, for the listeners if they want to download that. So when you're not listening to the earning calls for 3M, what podcast are you listening to? Oh, good question. Um so I'll listen to uh, a couple of tech related podcasts. I'll listen to some uh, some leadership related podcasts as well. Um, yeah. Harvard Business Review puts one on. I think it's uh, coaching for leaders where they just go through and, and talk with actual leaders about, you know, challenges that they're facing or problems they're trying to trying to overcome. Um, and then I listen to a couple of uh, podcasts around tech, around, you know, up and coming startups, up and coming technology, just to try and you know, keep my fingers on the pulse of what's happening out there in the tech market. And then, you know, I can kind of weave those things together to say, oh, I, this is interesting with, you know, they're talking about generative AI and, you know, how, they're, how uh, people are using that to create pictures and things like that. And like, what is that going to mean for the manufacturing market in the next coming X, Y, and Z, uh, X, Y, and Z year? So um, there's one A16 and Z, which is the Andreessen Horowitz podcast, does a pretty good job of that. And, and they were just talking about uh, some future manufacturing uh, in there as well. So those are a couple that I listen to. 
Okay. There you go. Well, thank you for sharing those. I would love to get that. Now, you mentioned you're a big reader. So what type of, what genre? What, what, what are we reading here? Um, tech, I'm assuming, or do you have other types of stuff you, yeah, you like to Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a nonfiction reader. So I will typically read books about, again, uh, tech. I've been reading a lot about um, uh, leadership and, and, you know, thinking about things like operational rigor and discipline and how that, you know, cascades throughout an organization. Um, and then uh, I do a lot, I'm reading a lot about um, statistics and finance, uh, again, thinking okay. about, you know, sort of next generation of, of manufacturing and how we leverage data and statistics, but also, you know, thinking about how we tie these things like digital transformation initiatives to, to real ROI. Um, and so uh, a lot of nonfiction, um, but, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's fun to me anyway. There you go. There, hey, that's what's most important. So tell you what, we're getting towards the end. We'd like to do a quick lightning round with our guest uh, just to get a, 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 some fun facts for our listeners. So if you're willing to play that, we'll jump right into our for lightning sure. round here. All right. So we start always start off easy, man. So what's your favorite food? Oh, goodness gracious. So born and raised in Michigan, but I moved out to California about 10 years ago. And, and people told me, they're like, there's this thing called In-N-Out hamburgers that you have to try. And I was like, nah, eh, the hamburgers aren't my thing. And I but I but now I could eat in and out hamburgers every day of the week. I don't know why <laughs> it's a thing. I'm pretty sure they're, they're it's just because it's a, a West Coast thing. But that's my uh, I, I got to say, that's probably my favorite food. OK. All right. In and out. So do you ha is there an adult beverage that you like to have with that in and out burger? No, you know what? Um, my uh, my favorite uh, my favorite beverage these days is sparkling water, and uh, I keep getting into these weird like just trying different uh, trying different things. And so I've been trying um, kombucha lately, which is like you know okay. fermented uh, fermented tea is supposed to be really helpful for you. So those are my two new uh, go to go to drinks. Okay, I just, well, I just saw a. Uh, a video the other day somebody gave a dog sparkling water and the reaction on the dog's face was hilarious so <laughs> maybe you should try that with your puppy <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned so you're a michigan guy so i gotta find out so sports teams look where, where are you lining there anthony uh college football at university of michigan go blue um I am still uh, where where pro uh, football guy and where pro football is concerned. You know, I, I'm still a Lions fan, and and I know I, I know I'm gonna get my heart broken. You know, most years, um, but I keep I keep hanging on, hoping that one day we're we're gonna turn it around. <laughs> there's always hope, right? There's there's always next year. You know, exactly. That's exactly that, it. Right? It's like you know what? We learned some lessons this year, and we're gonna take <laughs> those true. forward to to next year. But but uh, Michigan's having a good a good season this year, so I'm I'm hoping uh, Harbaugh's gonna take it. I will tell you, yeah, at the time of our recording, Michigan they are they are looking strong. I mean, they look yeah. really good. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they 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 run in the, the playoffs. I'm excited. To, I'm excited to see that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's keep going in our lightning round. So uh, what's something that's on your nightstand? Oh, I always keep uh, some sort of uh, some sort of glass of water. I typically have two or three books um, and then uh, and then my phone. I'm never I'm never too far away from my phone because there's always something I'm like, I'll wake up in the night. I'm like, oh, I need to make sure I remember to do that. Um, so those are the things I, I keep on my nightstand. All right. How about what's sticking with your phone? What's your favorite app on your phone? Oh, I love, um, you know, just the standard notes app um, that uh, okay. that Apple and iOS has. Uh, I use that a lot. I use the podcast app is probably my second second favorite one because I listen to uh, this telling you with running. Um, yep. And then I have a run uh, a running app run meter that I use to track my runs. Those are probably the ones if you were to look at my uh, my usage. Uh, those are the ones that I that I probably hit the most. So for your running, it's, you said it's called run meter. Yep. Okay. All right. I have to check that out. I, I used the Nike Run Club app. Yes. But uh, but I have to check Run Meter out. See how that looks. Yeah. You know, I I just like to um, I you know I'm never trying to you know break a, a land speed record, but I like to track my mileage, and it's got a pretty yeah. good capability with uh, just tracking the the distance and the time, and you know every once in a while when I'm when I'm feeling uh, when I'm feeling uh, particularly energetic, I'll I'll try and sprint it and see how fast I can go. And so it does a pretty good job of that too. There you go. There you go. All right. Let's, let's keep rolling here. So what's your all time favorite movie? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, 
the uh, it'll be White Christmas uh, with Bing Crosby. Really, I, I saw the musical. All right, so I probably just lost a few cards with some of the guys. That's okay. I, I, you I know, it's probably music. the same thing, and I don't even <laughs> care. It's one of those things we watched all the time growing up, and and I could watch that a um, hundred times over and be just fine. It was really good. It was. Re- I must admit, I had a good time with my wife at that one. So, how about music? What's your favorite music? Oh goodness, I um I will listen to just about everything, and I know that's an uh, that is an easy answer. Um, but I like to just throw on the um, uh, a shuffle on either like uh, Spotify or Pandora and just see what uh, see what rolls and and just keep going with it. Okay, all right. Now, last question for the lightning run, Anthony: Dogs or cats? Oh, that's a hard one. I have a dog and I have a cat. Um, I got to say the, uh, the dog is, uh, is a lot more fun. It, I think the dog likes me a lot more, um, but it requires a lot more work. So I, I, maybe I'll go with dogs on this one. Okay. Well, there was only one right answer and you, you did get it by the skin of your teeth. So, uh, very, very good. So we can definitely, we can roll this episode now. So uh, <laughs> I'm just joking, but Hey, I had a lot of fun with that lightning round, Anthony. This has been uh, just a delight to get to know you and, we call it Eco Ask Why. We always wrap up with the why. So we'll kind of go back to where we, where we started. So why should those manufacturers out there that they're listening, why should they embrace this idea of quality as a mindset moving into the future? Yeah, I think it's it's all around the fact that, you know, agility and resiliency and the idea that, you know, you want to be able to build a better product, build a better business, build a, build a better culture and employee base, and, and likewise be able to, you know, grow the business and, and circumvent any sort of challenges that come up. And so if you build quality as a culture, it gets into every employee and things just become a little bit easier because everybody's driving in the same direction. And so, you know, business benefits aside, you know, we talk about operations being super stressful, like it, it does reduce the stress a little bit. Um, because everybody's driving in the, in the same direction. Um, and it just makes your business more resilient. So it's the, uh, it's the way to, you know, take a little bit of the load off, but, uh, but also make sure that you're well prepared for whatever comes, uh, what comes our way. Absolutely. Now, where, where should the listeners go? If they want to connect with you or Plex to learn more, where would you like to direct them? Yeah. So, uh, if you want to learn more about Plex, Plex Plex.com, we have about all of the things uh, not only about our products, but also really great resources on on how to think about digital transformation, how to think about building a culture. Uh, if you're looking for me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Anthony J. Murphy. I'm happy to connect and happy to happy to chat more there. All right. And we'll make sure all that's synced up in the show notes for you listeners out there. But Anthony, is there anything else you'd like to share today? No, you know what? I've had, Chris, just a ton of fun. I really, really appreciate the time and and again, manufacturing is, uh, to your point, it's just this amazing place of, of transformation. It's this amazing place of community. And so, um, you know, definitely recommend those that are thinking about it, um, you know, get in and check it out. It's, it's an amazing it's an amazing place to build a career. Absolutely. Well, man, it's been a, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom today on Eco Ask Why. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 